Well, the book of Exodus, here we are again, the story of redemption, a book of redemption, a book that pictures our redemption. And we're going to pick up, if you have been following along with us, at the close of chapter 5. Leading up to this point, Moses has had his first confrontation with Pharaoh, and he demanded, as instructed by the Lord, that Pharaoh let his people go three days' journey into the wilderness to worship the Lord their God. But Pharaoh will have none of it. If you guys have time to take time off, then you have time to uh, produce the same quota of bricks without being provided straw. And so he added to their burden. Moses makes this command as instructed by the Lord, but Pharaoh denies him, makes things more difficult for the people. And so with that, we're going to pick up in verse 21 of chapter 5. It says, and they, that is the, the children of Israel, said to them, Aaron and Moses, let the Lord look on you and judge, because you have made us abhorrent in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants to put a sword in their hand to kill us. This, things are so much more difficult once you showed up on the scene, Moses. Things are a lot harder. And, and they believe that they're in a position in that, man, we're going to die. Now, is that reasonable? Is that logical conclusion? Well, perhaps. They've been a slave for 400 years, and now things are ex exponentially more difficult. It sure wasn't what they expected. They warmly received Moses and Aaron when they first showed up on the scene and said, God is here. He's going to deliver you. But God's plan hasn't working out like they hoped, the way they thought it should. This is how God's plan should work in our lives. Have you ever had that? You ever think, this is how God's plan should work in my life? I'm sure you have. If you're a believer, you've had an idea of this is what God's going to do. This is how he's going to do it. And you thought God's work in your life would look one way. And it turns out he has a radically different way than you expected. Oftentimes a painful way. And so they, like we so often, don't understand the reason for the difficulty that they're facing. And so while they're, they're facing this adversity, they're venting, to Moses, you've made things worse. Verse 22, so Moses in turn then, it says, return to the Lord. And said, Lord, why have you brought trouble on this people? Why is it you've sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he, Pharaoh, has done evil to this people. Neither have you delivered your people at all. He's blaming the Lord. He's having a little crisis of faith himself. So he cries out to the Lord. And what's gracious, and we're going to see this more than once, what the Lord does for Moses is what he so often does for us. He does what we do for our kids. He just repeats the same truth that he needs to hear. We, don't we tend, when we find ourselves in those difficult times, those painful situations, the things that we don't understand, that we can't quite comprehend, that we want new information. When I don't understand, Lord, you must have new information for me to receive. But really, more often than not, I think what we'll find, what I have found in my life, I just need to remember the promises that have already been made. I just need to, to, to hear again God's heart for me, that he does have a plan, and that uh, there's difficulty along the way, oftentimes in that plan. But when we're going through it, when times are hard, when, when the unexpected and the unpleasant happens in our life, we say, Lord, like the children of Israel here, why did you bring this trouble upon me? Uh, I see my neighbor. Nothing seems to be going wrong with him. Everything's peachy. He's got a new house. He's got, you know, a new car, a big boat. Everything's just great. Lord, why is this trouble on me? Following you seems harder 
than not following you. And we just need to remember the same truths that the Lord has told us time and time again. Now the Lord said in John 16, verse 33, he said, these things that I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. You're gonna have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Be in me, I've overcome the world. I need that reminder. Don't you need that reminder too? Oh my goodness, I, more than I care to admit, I need that reminder. And if we'll j- listen to the Lord as he gently will repeat to us the same promise that was dear to us maybe 20 years ago, something like Romans 8, 28. We know that all things do work together for good for those who love God, to those who have been called according to his purpose. Lord, I need to be reminded of that in my difficulty. In this hard thing that I'm facing, you have a plan. You have a purpose. And even though I can't see what it is, I'm called. I understand that I'm yours and you are going to do something with that. We'll open up his word and, and we'll be reminded in James 1. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And I realize that even though I don't like this difficulty, I don't like this hard thing, I don't like this challenge, the adversity that I'm facing, it's not what I expected, it's not how I planned, Lord, for you to to do things. You're doing a work, and I need to let you do that work. And so just as we remind our children of the same truth, Well, we do, don't we? We just remind them over and over and over again. We get frustrated sometimes, but Lord, just so patient. He reminds Moses of the same things he's already told him. And he gives him a reminder here in chapter six. The Lord said to Moses, now you shall see. You're thinking you won't see, but you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. Moses, you're you're fearing Pharaoh more than me. You're fearing the words of Pharaoh, the words of the enemy. They're having a bigger influence in your life than I am. But you will see. I want you to see. And you're going to see, he goes on to say, with that with a strong hand, I will let them go. It might not seem like it. It might not be going how you thought it should, but I will do what I said I will do. Uh, He will let them go, and with a strong hand, he will drive them out of his land. And and really, we talked about this uh, a few Sundays ago. It's really the Lord's strong hand that is going to uh, bring freedom to his people. Other translations, if you have a different translation, it might say something by compulsion, or the Lord himself is going to compel his people to be freed. And so, verse 2, God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, Lord, I was not known to them. You're worried about how things are playing out, Moses? But remember who I am. I am the I am. I'm exactly what you need. I'm exactly who I was when I first met you there at the burning bush and I called you into this ministry. I change not. I'm self-existent. I'm self-sufficient. I'm sovereign. I'm unchanging. I'm eternal. I'm I'm the God. I'm your God. I'm the God of your people, of your family. I'm the God of this people. And he says in verse four, I have also established my covenant with them. And this is the covenant that I've established with my people to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage in which they were strangers. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel whom the Egyptians keep in bondage and I have remembered my covenant. God remembers his covenant people and we are his covenant people we're the part of the new covenant. But he reminds Moses what he already knew. And he wants us to understand that too. He's going to give to Moses now a list of seven things that he will do. I encourage you, if you mark up your Bible, to mark these down. He says, Therefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage. 
And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. I will take you as my people and I will be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I will give it to you as a heritage. I am the Lord. Did you get all these I wills that Moses need to be reminded of? I'm the God of the covenant. I'm not going to not fulfill what I have promised. And so I will bring you out. I will rescue you from your bondage. I'll redeem you. I will take you as my people. I'll be your God. I'll bring you into the land and I will give it to you as a heritage. Now notice that not one time in this list of things that God will do does the Lord say if. He doesn't say if the people do this or if Moses you do this. I'm the one that fulfills the covenant promise. I am the God of the covenant. And he says, Moses, I'm going to do these things. I will do this. And what you also need to be reminded of is that I am going to use you to do it. I will use you. And it's not going to be because of your oratorical skills. It's not going to be, Moses, because of your ability to administrate or to organize. It's not through your charisma your dashing good looks, your uh, ability to negotiate, your familiarity with the court of Pharaoh. I am going to show my strength through you, through your weakness, through your inability. It's not dependent upon you. I will do it. And this is, this is still the Lord's MO. This is the beauty of Christianity, that it's all about him. It's not about us. It's not about what we do for the Lord, but what he's done for us. Every other religious system, every other cult and sect, it's about what you can do for your God. It's works related. It's what can you do to earn eternal life, to earn heaven. It's all dependent upon you. Every other God, lowercase g, does not have a God that says, I will. It says, you better. Our God says, I will. Christianity, it's all about what he has done. And that's why Christianity, as opposed to every other belief system, religious system, every other sect is truly what sets us free. Because it's not dependent upon us. It's not how hard can you work. That's a burden. That's heavy. You know, I was in India, we, we, I... Elijah and I went to this uh, Hindu temple and there's all sorts of things that they were offering in, in a couple different areas to this uh, god. Um, Humamen, I think is this god's name. Half uh, chimpanzee, half human. And I thought it was a little stereotypical. Like they were throwing bananas in one area. I'm like, you're just like assuming that's what he would want because he's a monkey. But anyway, uh, it was so sad as we walked around this thing. There's all sorts of, there's a list of acceptable things to offer and you can purchase and try to make yourself right. But as we came around the one corner and I, I, there's this place where uh, all, all these folks were lined up to like uh, pay homage to the God and uh, this one mom was like forcing her, her little son to like get down on his knees before him. And it's, what, what are you going to do? You have to work towards this. And Christianity, and that's the, the maybe the, the far extent of it, but every other belief system, every religion, every sect that you could possibly think of, it's what can you do? And only in Christianity are we truly set free. Because Jesus has done all the work. Amen. We just respond out of devotion. Lord, you took the cross for us. You have made us right. And so out of devotion, out of what you have done, we just want to accept what you have. You know, we, we're, we are the ones that come with empty hands. Not here's what I have. I'm going to give you whatever you might want to earn heaven. But we just receive. It's by grace you've been saved. He welcomes us to just let me be the one that does the work. You trust in the work that I have done for you. So Moses here, he hears and receives. 
these great promises that God has for the nation of Israel. And he, verse 9, spoke, Moses spoke thus to the children of Israel. Okay, I just heard this list of things that God's going to do. I got pumped up and excited about this. Let's go. I'll tell them. But they did not heed Moses because of the anguish of spirit and cruel bondage. Again, for a moment, when he first came on the scene, for, for a moment, they believed that they were free. They trusted in what God had said about them being free, and they received that empty-handed, but no longer. They are continuing, instead of receiving and believing these I wills of God, they are believing the lies of the enemy. They're, they're misstepping because they, things aren't going the way I thought they should, then this must not be salvation. This must not be deliverance because it doesn't look like I thought it should. But in God's timetable, everything is going exactly as planned. He would lead them with a strong hand, but it took the hardness of Pharaoh's heart. To, to, it's going to take that to get them there, to make the timing right. And again, it would seem like the timing is all wrong. There's no question that if we were there, if we were under the strong hand uh, of, of taskmasters in, in slavery in Egypt, we would feel like this is, God, you promised deliverance. Where is it? It's not supposed to be things got more difficult, that things got more hard, that the, the timeline got pushed out. It wouldn't make sense to us either, but... Again, it's by faith. And so in hindsight, we can see there's some purposes to these times that God delays in our life. And that there's purpose in God's delaying here amongst the children of Israel. Number one, that this delay revealed hearts and motives. Like what if that first time Moses came and said, let my people go, Pharaoh said, let them go? Sure, you bet. So let it be written, so let it be done. The Egyptians needed judgment. They deserved judgment. They, they were completely heathen, completely pagan, godless people. And it would seem unjust if he let the people go and then sent the plagues. This timing had to be right. But in that delay, Pharaoh's heart is going to be revealed. E Egypt's heart is going to be revealed. And it's also this delay revealed the heart of the uh, Israelites themselves. It, it revealed that, that they needed to walk in faith, that they had some doubt in their life. Number two, delays are opportunities to grow in faith. As I said, the Israelites, they still needed to trust God. God had, God had more work to do in Moses. There was faith to be grown in him as well. He was still learning to trust God completely. And, and when things don't go our way, when they don't go your way, when they don't go my way, it's an opportunity for us to grow in faith too. Because there's going to be times that things don't go your way. That is an opportunity for us to say, Lord, I trust you. I'm going to follow you. I, I believe what your word has said to me. It's an opportunity for us to grow that faith within ourselves. Number three, when things don't go the way we, we think we should, we learn the value of our redemption. We learn the value of our redemption. The Israelites wouldn't understand and learn the cost of the Passover lamb, the sacrificial lamb. They wouldn't understand and see how strong God was on their behalf except by Pharaoh's refusal, except by this delay that they don't like. And, and we too, we don't always understand what God has done for us when things go our way. But when things become a grind, when things become difficult, it's only then that we, we see the resources that God has for us, the cost that he has expended on our behalf, the blood that was poured out for us. Number four, God's delays teach us that his judgment and salvation is always on time. 
If you'll remember back to the book of Genesis, the Lord had promised Abraham, I will bring your people back to this land when the sin of the Amorites, the people in the land, when the sin of the Amorites has what? Reached its full. God still had 40 years of grace to extend to the Amorites. And so God's timing gave them that opportunity, gave them time to repent. That time also gave Rahab the needed time to accept the Lord, to believe on the Lord and be saved. And finally, number five, God's picture for us, this delay helps us to realize that God's picture for us was not complete. We still need to learn that going through the Red Sea, as 1 Corinthians 10 says, is a picture of our baptism. That Moses striking the rock was a picture of Jesus being smitten for us. That the bronze snake that we'll read about in the book of Numbers being lifted up on the pole is also a type of Jesus when those who looked upon him were saved. All of those things, they couldn't see at that moment. Things weren't playing out quite like they thought they would, much like we have in our life. But God is still doing important work in these delays in our life. Now, the Lord, verse 10, speaks to Moses again, saying, go in, tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the children of Israel go out of his land. And Moses spoke before the Lord, saying, the children of Israel have not heeded me. How then shall Pharaoh heed me? For I am of uncircumcised lips. This may refer to the, some think that Moses, you know, had a speech impediment. It could be that he just recognized that he was sinful, that he was unequipped for the task. He didn't feel worthy to be used. It's like, I can't get, I can't get to my own people to believe that this is what you want to do. How can I get Pharaoh to believe? So the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, verse 13, and gave them a command for the children of Israel and for Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. The Lord is continuing to teach Moses not to look to the people for validation. If you're just looking for them to believe everything you say, well, that's going to validate your ministry, your calling, you're looking in the wrong spot. I want you to look to me, to trust me in all of this. Now, verse 14 I know you all are in the mood. You're like, man, I hope there's a good genealogy tonight. And so it's your night. It's your time. Verse 14, here's the the Lord's redeemed. These are the heads of their father's houses. The sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, were Hanok, Pelu, Hezron, and Carmi. These are the families of Reuben. And the sons of Simeon were Jemuel, Jamin, Ohad, Jachin, Zohar, and Shaal, the son of a Canaanite woman. These are the families of Simeon. These are the names of the sons of Levi, according to their generations, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. And the years of the life of Levi were 137. The sons of Gershon were Libni and Shimei, according to their families. And the sons of Kohath were Amram, Izhar, Hebron, and Uziel. And the years of the life of Kohath were 133. The sons of Merari were Malai and Mushi. Sounds Japanese, but... These are the families of Levi, according to their generations. Verse 20, now Amram took for himself Jochebed, this is Moses' parents. His father's sister as wife could be as a, or cousin. And she bore him Aaron and Moses. And the years of the life of Amram were 137. The sons of Izhar were Korah, Nepheg, and Zikri. And the sons of Uziel were Mishael, Elzaphan, and Zithri. Verse 23, Aaron took to himself Elishaba, daughter of Aminadab, sister of Nashon, as wife, and she bore him Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. As we'll see, these four sons of Aaron, they're going to have, uh, uh, well, a prominent role in the cabinet, as we'd put it today. They're going to have important jobs in the priestly leadership. Not always successfully, not always well, but important jobs. Verse 24, the sons of Korah were Asir, Elkahana, and Abishaph, 
These are the families of the Korathites. Verse 25, Eleazar, Aaron's son, took for himself one of the daughters of Putiel as wife, and she bore him Phineas. These are the heads of the fathers' houses of the Levites, according to their families. These are the same Aaron and Moses, to whom the Lord said, Bring out the children of Israel from the land of Egypt, according to their armies. These are the ones who spoke to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring out the children of Israel from Egypt. These are the same Moses and Aaron. So this genealogy here may seem out of place initially, but God is validating that this is Moses' lineage. He is the son of Levi. He is the son of Jacob. And it's this Moses, it's this Aaron that I have called. My calling on their life is to confront Pharaoh to free my people. Now, verse 28, it came to pass on the day the Lord spoke to Moses in the land of Egypt that the Lord spoke to Moses saying, I am the Lord. Speak to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all that I say to you. It may not be going, Moses, exactly like you thought, like the people thought, but it's going exactly according to my plan. The people may not be accepting you. They may not be heeding you, as you've put it, but you are, you are, Moses, the one that I have called to lead my people out of Egypt. So I want you to speak to Pharaoh exactly what I tell you. Now, verse 30 he again repeats this same objection. But Moses said before the Lord, Behold, I'm of uncircumcised lips, and how shall Pharaoh heed me? Again, he's just he's operating in fear, and we can do that too before we get too judgmental. Uh, but if we remember, this probably wasn't exactly true of Moses. Stephen said in Acts chapter 7 of Moses that he was mighty in word and deed. And so he's still operating in fear, but God, the Lord, so patient, reminds him again of the calling in his life. Chapter 7. So the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you as God to Pharaoh, and Aaron, your brother, shall be your prophet or your spokesperson. You shall speak all that I command you, and Aaron, your brother, shall tell Pharaoh to send the children of Israel out of his land. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. But Pharaoh will not heed you so that I may lay my hand on Egypt and bring my armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments." God is so gracious, so patient here. You know, I mentioned earlier, you know, that striking the rock uh, was a picture, a sign of Jesus being smitten for us. But what did, how did Moses mess up towards the end of his life? He struck that rock again because he was frustrated with the people. This hard-headed people. Why don't you get it? Why don't you understand? And he, he failed to remember how gracious God is with him. How many times has he raised objections to God's calling in his life? But God's not upset with him. God's not mad. The Lord just lets him know, Moses, I have equipped you for your calling. I'll remind you again. I'll tell you again. And so even if Pharaoh rejects you, when his heart is hard, and it will be hard, he will re reject the message, Moses. But what I need you to remember it's going to help you to remember that I do have this calling in your life, that when he rejects the message, he's actually rejecting me. His heart isn't hard toward you necessarily. It's, it may manifest itself that way, but his, hard, his heart is hard against me. He's rejecting me, and you're the recipient of that. And this is a good reminder for us too. The Lord has equipped us. He has a calling on our life. He has told us to go to make disciples of all nations. That's not for some select few. That's for everybody. That's for all of us. It's what I want to talk about this coming Sunday, I think, if you're able to be here, is that God has this calling on our life to be those who raise up disciples so that they can raise up disciples. That's God's plan for the church. He has this calling on our life. He has equipped us through our own testimony, through our own witness to share the good news. And to go make disciples. And so 
If we understand that that's the calling, that God has equipped us for that, if and when we are met with rejection, and we will be, not everybody you and I talk to is going to receive the Lord, is going to just like, yes, I want some of that, give that to me. When we're met with hard-heartedness and rejection, we shouldn't take it personally. That's what the Lord is telling Moses here. I have called you, I have equipped you, But just because Pharaoh doesn't listen doesn't mean I have not. I have. But his heart is hard towards me. And so, verse 5, The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. Now, I want you to... um, Notice this phrase, that they, they shall know that I am the Lord. And as we're getting into now the plagues, this is going to be the overarching theme. One of the reasons that they may know that I am the Lord. And so Moses and Aaron, they receive this reminder of God's purpose, God's calling on their life, that, those reminders that we need so often. And they receive it. And so now, as we head into verse 6, they go fearlessly a second time before the most powerful person on the planet. Moses and Aaron did so. Just as the Lord commanded him, so they did. And Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. Almost old enough for Jake Paul to fight them. No, I'm just joking. (laughs) Never too old to be used by the Lord. 80 and 83. Now, I want you to turn to Romans chapter 1 here, if you would. God, God told Moses in verse 3, I'm not, I don't want to gloss over this. This is something that we need to address, need to talk about it. We've talked about it a little bit. But God told Moses in verse 3, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. But what we need to understand when we read this and we see this, that it's more of a ratifying Pharaoh's own heart. Pharaoh's heart is already hard towards the things of God. He had already said the first time around earlier in chapter 5, who is the Lord that I should obey him? His word means nothing to me. His heart was already hard towards the Lord. And so when it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart, we, we just need, I think, this reminder that the Lord doesn't infuse hardness into people's hearts. Like you want to have a good, soft, loving heart, and God says, no, I'm going to put hardness into your heart. He hardens the heart, hardens heart perhaps of those that we love and we care about. But he hardens hearts by withholding mercy. And all that's needed to harden Pharaoh's heart here is to remove God's grace, God's mercy from Pharaoh's life and to give Pharaoh over to his own hard-heartedness, to his own depravity, okay? And that's what Paul addresses in Romans chapter 1. I'm going to pick up in verse 24. Therefore, Paul says, God also gave them up to uncleanness, in the lusts of their hearts, or according to their heart's desire, to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie, and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. First part of verse 26, for this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. What Paul is saying, those who are bent on disobedience, those who have the, the, the lust of their heart, the desires of their own heart, who demand things their way, and this is what I want. I just want to gratify myself. God says, okay, you do that enough. I'm going to withhold my mercy, and I'm going to give you over to what you really want in your life. And what that looks like, that Paul is addressing here, for even their woman exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. I'm not talking about lesbianism. Verse 27. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of a woman, burned in lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of the error which was due. And then look at verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, 
God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. There's just this hard-heartedness. I, I want this so bad that I don't care what God says. And they reach this place where God says, I'm just going to confirm that this is what you choose. I'm going to let you continue to walk in disobedience to see the painful place that that's going to take you. Now, we can all experience this to some degree or another. Um, you know, when the box says some assembly required and you say no, uh, you know, I got this. I'm not going to look at the directions. I can figure this out. Or for me, probably most often it's, uh, do you need directions? Do you need to ask for directions? No, I do not. I remember one time we were driving in, in Northern California uh, and um, I was so sure that I had looked at the map correctly and I knew where I was going. And before I knew it, and when I say before I knew it, I'm talking like a half an hour, 45 minutes later, it turned from pavement to gravel. And I told Charity, like, we have gone so far in this direction, like, we have to keep going this way now. I mean, we've got to be getting close, right? And then another 10, 15 minutes, the gravel turned to a dirt road, and I'm seeing dirt bikes. Uh, we watched a snake cross the road right in front of us. Like, just, you give yourself over. Like, no, I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to go my own way, and there's consequences. Now, turn to uh, Romans chapter 9, if you're still in Romans. Now, there's minor consequences when it comes to something like asking for directions, but eternal consequences when it comes to resisting what God has instructed for our life. That's no small thing. Now, this is good and, and telling as we're looking and trying to wrap our mind around hardening of Pharaoh's heart and how the sovereignty of God and the choice of man fits together. Look with me at verse 15 of Romans 9. For he says to Moses, that is the Lord, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills or of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to the Pharaoh, for this very purpose I raised you up, that I may show my power in you and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore, he has mercy on whom he wills, and on whom he wills, he hardens. God is sovereign. He will withhold mercy, and the outcome will be Pharaoh's going to have a hard heart. Okay? Now, verse 19. This is good. This is good for us to understand. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will. Paul says, I know what you're going to say. I know what you're going to ask. If Pharaoh's heart is hard, so that for the very purpose, it says in, in verse 18, that he was raised up for this, to have a hard heart to show his power. How can, if it's accomplishing God's will, how can there be fault found in Pharaoh? When God allowed this, raised him up for this very purpose, he's in the plan and the will of God. He knows we're going to ask that question. And his response, verse 20, Indeed, O oh man, who are you, and who am I, to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, Why have you made me like this? God is sovereign in his giving mercy to some. He's sovereign in withholding that mercy from others. And he's also sovereign in who he determines to do that and who he doesn't. Does not, look at verse 21, does not the potter have the power over the clay? And when you think of it that way, if you could just picture this pottery wheel going around, obviously. Doesn't he have the power of the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? Can't he make a vase or an ashtray? Isn't that up to him? Creation doesn't have the right to question the creator. It would be like me, uh, you know, I'm not much of an artist. If I was to draw a stick figure and, and this stick figure shook its little hand back at me, it's like, why did you make my neck so long? Why, why aren't my eyes symmetrical, right? Paul says, God is the potter. We're the clay. 
And if we look at the situation back in Exodus now, chapter 7, like pottery, Pharaoh has already hardened his heart. And, and God says, I'm going to let you stay hard and I'm actually going to put you in the kiln. And I'm going to let you continue down this path that you were already choosing yourself. So back to Exodus chapter 7, verse 8. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, when Pharaoh speaks to you saying, show a miracle for yourselves, then you shall say to Aaron, take the rod and cast it before Pharaoh and let it become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh and they did so, just as the Lord commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants and it became a serpent. This is an overlooked thing, I think, in the whole narrative of what's taking place. This, they are walking in faith now. They walked in there with a rod and God says, you throw it down and it's going to become a serpent. That took great faith, great obedience, great trust in God. I'm going to do what you have said, oh, even though I don't see exactly how this is. And he casts it down and, and just as the Lord had done before, it turns into a serpent. But, but, verse 11, Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. So the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. Now, we don't learn their names here. Interestingly, if you take notes, we, we find the name of two of these men in 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy 3, verses 7 to 9, tell us that two of these men's names are Janus and Jambres. Now, I don't know what you do with that information. I don't know why it wasn't recorded here, but we learn it in the New Testament, but we actually know two of these folks' names. But they, they're brought here, and then it says in verse 12, for every man threw down his rod, and they became serpents. How do you think Moses and Aaron felt at that time? Man, we thought we had this thing on lockdown. We thought this is it. Boom. And then all of a sudden, everybody's doing it. I didn't see that coming. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. They also didn't see that coming. They'd be like, oh yeah. And Pharaoh's heart grew hard. That's on his own doing. And he did not heed them as the Lord had said. Just an obvious validation of God's power. Throws it down, becomes a snake, and then swallows up theirs. Now, we will see that these guys even have the ability uh, to reproduce two of the plagues coming up. And we've got to ask, well, how did they do it? They did turn theirs into serpents. That's incredible. That's Mariah. Was it sleight of hand? Was it magicianship? Was it just pretend? It doesn't sound that. It sounds like it's miraculous. So actually, if you turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, I think this is important for us to get down, especially as we are headed and steamrolling towards these last days, to remind ourselves that miracles, signs, and wonders are part of Satan's arsenal. Miracles can prove that something is supernatural, but they cannot prove that something is true. And that's important for us, even and especially, I would say, within the church to understand. Miracles can prove something is supernatural, but they don't prove that something is true. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan. With all power, notice, signs and lying wonders. And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. Because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. They had hard hearts. Verse 11. And for this reason, God will send them a strong delusion. That they should believe the lie. That they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. They had pleasure in unrighteousness. They deliberately turned away from the truth towards sin, had a heart of heart. And instead of believing, they, they fell for God says, I'll let you believe this counterfeit. I'm going to let you believe the delusion, the lie. And so that's what's happening here in the book of Exodus. 
And it's going to happen in the last days too. And we'll talk about that as we continue on in Exodus, that there's a mirror, there's a picture here, not only of our redemption, but how the plagues, Pharaoh, how all of that pictures the last days. But Pharaoh is deliberately turning from truth, hardening his heart, and God let him believe the lie. Let him uh, be, you know, bite, fall for the, de the delusion. And so these signs that these men did, these men of his court were initially the same, but the difference was that Moses and Aaron's miracle, they're all supernatural, but Moses and Aaron's miracle is accompanied by and according to God's word. It lines up with God's word. And that's still the best way as we steamroll towards the last days for us to validate signs. As we, as we go through it, we see these signs, these plagues, they, they don't really produce faith. They affirm faith in the life of the Hebrews. They fill the Israelites with some hope, but they're also, these same miracles are going to affirm the hardness of Pharaoh's heart. And so he is affirming and, and hardening his heart despite this evidence. In fact, verse 13 repeats again, Pharaoh's heart grew hard and he did not heed them as the Lord had said. He heard, but he did not heed. Sounds like the kids, doesn't it? I know you heard me. <laughs> Why aren't you heeding me? But I think the father would say the same to us sometimes. You've heard, but you have not heeded. It's an important step to make, to not just be hearers, Jesus would say, but to be doers of the word. Now, the 10 plagues begin. We're just going to get going into this uh, a little bit tonight. Um, and I'd encourage you, if you're writing your Bible, maybe right around this section, if, there, if there's a heading or something, to write Hebrews 10, verse 31. It says, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And that's exactly what Pharaoh and the Egyptians are going to experience in the next few chapters. Now, before we jump headlong into this, uh, who, you know, when you're growing up, if you grew up in the church, this is like your favorite thing. One of the most dramatic confrontations in the entire Bible is the ten plagues, right? But I think it's good for us to ask, what's God's purpose in the ten plagues? Why did God judge Egypt this way? And as a kid, again, I love this. I love the confrontation and these mighty acts, this miraculous stuff. But as a kid, I, I kind of thought, because I, I thought as a child, that God is mad and he's lashing out. Like dad came home and he's mad that we didn't clean the house and he flipped the table over and slammed the door. Like it's that kind. But there, there's very real and profitable reasons for these plagues. And so if you take notes, the Bible gives us six reasons, at least six reasons and purposes for the plagues. Purpose number one is recorded in Exodus 5 verse 2 uh, to answer Pharaoh's question. Who is the Lord? That's what Pharaoh said. In the hardness of his heart, who is the Lord that I should obey? Well, the Lord's going to show you who he is that you should obey. He answers that question. Purpose number two is found in Exodus 9, verse 16, to show the power of God through Moses. He is going to show himself strong. He's going to deliver with a strong hand, and the people are going to see that and recognize the power of God. Purpose number three is recorded in chapter 10, verse 2, to give a testimony to the children of Israel for future generations. This is something that will not be forgotten. The psalmist would, would, psalmist would write multiple times about how powerful God is, how great he is, the saving nature of God. This was a testimony to the, to the future descendants of the nation of Israel. Number four, I probably should have put these in, in uh, chronological order, but number four, 1 Sam, Samuel 4, verse 8, to warn the nations. 400 years 
Uh, 40 years later, when they come into the land, the, the Philistines remember. Rahab says, man, everybody's quaking in their boots. Their hearts are melting because they all know how powerful your God is. It's going to be a testimony to the nations. Number five is found in Exodus 15, verse 11. It's also found in Deuteronomy 4, verse 34. Deuteronomy 4, 34. A testimony to the greatness of of God to Israel, that they would see, that they would believe, that their faith, as I mentioned earlier, would be affirmed by this. The miraculous don't create, doesn't create faith, but it affirms faith. And then one more of these to notice, number six, Exodus 12, verse 12, also found in Numbers 33, verse four, to judge the false gods. And that's what we're gonna look at Primarily as we begin this portion of scripture, as we begin to talk about the plagues, that these plagues prove that God is greater than any false God there is, any false God of Egypt. And, and this is something that God would still desire us to remember as we read through these plagues. We have to remember sometimes that we have some gods in our life too that we begin to trust and depend upon. And uh, the Lord says, I have no other gods before me. And he wants us to just be done with those and just uh, show himself strong over everything that we, uh, that we perhaps falsely put hope in. Okay. Now, how these plagues are accomplished has been debated for forever and ever. One thing I, I just read recently a few weeks ago that I thought was super, super interesting. I was reading about Santorini. Um, if you were on the Footsteps of Paul tour, we went to Santorini. It is a, a volcano, uh, it's the rim of volcano, you know, and now it's just gorgeous up there in the middle of the sea. But that Santorini blew up about the same time as the plagues took place. Yeah, did that cause, does that, did God use that? That may be, I, I don't know. Did God use natural events outside of Egypt to cause and accomplish some of these plagues? Perhaps, I don't know. I don't even know that it's worth debating and getting hung up over because uh, even if he did, the timing and the character of the plagues prove that he is sovereign. If, it, if he did use Santorini, uh, he used Santorini. It didn't just happen, you know. And so and he didn't take credit later. Now, plague number one, verse 14, and we're actually going to go through these fairly quickly, I believe, turning water to blood. Verse 14, the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hard. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning when he goes out to the water and you shall stand by the river's bank to meet him. And the rod which was turned to a serpent you shall take in your hand and you shall say to him, the Lord God of the Hebrews has sent me to you saying, let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness. But indeed, until now you would not hear Thus says the Lord, by this you shall know that I am the Lord. Okay, you want to know who is the Lord that I should do this? That's what we're doing here. You're going to know who I am. Behold, I will strike the waters which are in the river with the rod that is in my hand, and they shall turn to blood. And notice this, and the fish that are in the river shall die, the river shall stink, and the Egyptians will loathe to drink the water of the river. Now, before I continue on, I want us to notice a couple things. Again, if you take notes, jot these down. It's interesting that these plagues are, are grouped in threes. Okay, there's three, 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 and then the final plague is the final plague all by itself, right? But the, the first two plagues of these sets, there's a warning and a call to repentance, okay? Okay. And then the third plague in each set comes without warning, okay? So plagues one and two, there's a warning. You should repent. You should turn your heart around. You should accept. You should let my people go. First two plagues have that. Third plague, without warning. Fourth plague, there's a warning. You should repent. You should turn your life around. You should let my people go. Fifth plague, same thing. Sixth, no warning, okay? And it's that way until you get to... Uh, 
throughout, and then number 10 is its, its own, okay? So keep that in mind that he does receive this warning, this call to repentance. And then again, plague one, it says, the Lord said, spoke to Moses, say to Aaron, take your rod, stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their streams, over their rivers, over their ponds, over their pools of water, that they may become blood. And there shall be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in the buckets of wood and the pitchers of stone. And Moses and Aaron did so just as the Lord commanded. So he lifted up the rod and struck the waters that were in the river in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants. And the waters that were in the river were turned to blood. Just such a dramatic scene. Reminds me of Charlton Heston just out there, right? The fish, verse 21, that were in the river died. The river stank and the Egyptians could not drink the water of the river. So there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. Now, how did this transpire? How did this take place? The, the, the more liberal theologian would say, and this is a quote, the water turned blood red because a mixture of poisonous algae. It's called harmful um, algal bloom, H-A-B. And red, the red soil that had been washed down from the mountains through the Blue Nile into the Nile itself. These poisonous substances were responsible for killing off the fish and leaving the Egyptians with no drinking water. I'm not buying it. I think the water was blood. And it doesn't explain how, you know, if that is the case. How did the water in the buckets and the pitchers turn to blood, right? Now, as I said, Exodus 12, verse 12, says that one of the purposes of the plagues is to execute judgment on the false gods. And so I want us to look at a few of the possible Egyptian gods that this would be affected. As we go through the plagues, every single one of them, it is a direct affront to the, the gods of Egypt. And one of those gods in this first plague is the Egyptian god Cahanum, which is called the god of potters. Um, he is believed to be a creator god, that he formed humans from the clay of the Nile and then exposed them to Ra, the sun god, and, and life was breathed into them. He's also said to be the guardian of the Nile. And uh, if he's the guardian of the Nile, he's not protecting his territory. This is the Lord's territory now. The second God is the God Hapi. Hapi um, was also affected. It's a fertility God said to be the God of the, the source of the Nile. Hapi was especially important to the Egyptians because this is the one, again, the source of the Nile that brought the flood every season that was necessary for the crops and for survival, for the fertility, all of that thing. All of that, you know, is dependent upon this God, Hapi. A third God is in view here, and that is the God Osiris, the God of judgment. And uh, he's pictured with a crook and a flail as he is the, a, a God of judgment. And he is thought to have the Nile River itself in his bloodstream. Well, if that's the case, he's bleeding profusely right now. But notice this. Again, verse 22. The magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments. And notice again, and Pharaoh's heart grew hard. Every time these magicians, every time the enemy works through these magicians, it causes Pharaoh's heart to grow harder and harder. The Lord's not doing that. He's bringing that on himself. And it says again that he did not heed them. As the Lord had said, and Pharaoh turned and went into his house, Neither was his heart moved by this. How hard does your heart have to be that there's zero drinking water? And I'm just like, you know, I ain't doing it. None of it. So as a response to this, all the Egyptians dug all around the river to drink for water because they could not drink the water of the river. And seven days passed after the Lord had struck the river. Now, as we look at these magicians... It, they did so with their enchantments. It says in verse 22, they turned more, they dug up water 
to turn it to blood. Like, like, don't we have enough of that? Like with friends like this, who needs enemies? Why didn't they, if they had power, why didn't they turn the bloody water pure? Why did they, like, let's dig up some more and, and we'll do this. Now, it would seem, again, as we go through this text, we look at the rest of scripture, we think about the, the future, the end times, that Satan cannot perform a constructive, life-giving miracle. He can operate in the supernatural, but he cannot operate towards goodness. And so in, in many ways, this, this first plague sets the tone for the plagues to come. And they, they do. They prove that the God of the Hebrews has authority over the natural world, that he is superior to the gods of Egypt, that every God will be and is subject to him. And it would be, again, wise for us to not just, like, this is fascinating, this is interesting, but to glean some application for ourselves here, that God is more powerful than any of the things that we promote in our life, that we give power to in our life, the false things that we are trusting. He wants to show us in his grace, in his mercy, that he's sovereign over all powers and principalities and everything that we trust in as well. Okay, now I'm going to go into verse eight, a couple more. We're almost done. Plague number two, the Lord spoke to Moses, go to Pharaoh and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. There's a warning here again. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite all your territory with frogs. And so the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up and come into your house, into your bedroom, on your bed, into the houses of your servants, on your people, into your ovens and into your kneading bowls. And the frogs shall come up on you, on your people, and on all your servants. That's just frightening. That's gross. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your hand with your rod over the streams, over the rivers and over the ponds and cause frogs to come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. Again, the liberal theologian would say the frogs were forced out of the water because of the pollution of the river. I, I ain't buying it. We're already told, I told us to take note that the fish died. Or am I to believe that the fish died, but the frogs were able to sustain themselves in, in this bloody water? You know, I don't think so. And so again, check this out. Unbelievably, verse seven, the magicians did so with their enchantments and brought up frogs on the land of Egypt. Like, they're in the ovens, they're in your kneading bowls. More? Like, this is what you're duplicating? But uh, this attack, this plague, showed God's superiority, superiority over the Egyptian god Heket. This is the Egyptian god of fertility, of renewal, of life, and uh, uh, just a real looker there, you know. Um, she's a... She, he is a beaut. Um, but frogs were highly thought of in Egypt. Being amphibious, they were they, you're part of two worlds, creatures of land and water, symbols of fertility. Uh, you know, they, they, uh, abundant, uh, they were abundant when the, the floods came. Uh, they took care of the bugs. They provided food. They were really highly thought of. And so apparently these magicians said, well, we could use some more, but... In verse 8, Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go that they may sacrifice to the Lord. Oh, did he have a breakthrough? Did his hard heart become soft? He saw this is God's work. He pleads with Moses to have the frogs taken away. And Moses said to Aaron, accept the honor of saying when I shall intercede for you, for your servants and for your people to destroy the frogs from you and your houses that they may remain in the river only. Man, it would be an honor for you to tell me when you want me to intercede to God about this. And check this out. Incredible. He said, tomorrow. 
Not today, not five minutes ago, tomorrow. I want one more night with these frogs. <laughs> now, again, I, I think that we're going to devote a, a Sunday to, to this in a couple weeks, but like our sins, frogs were, I said they were highly valued, highly thought of. They were, they were cherished. We can do that with our sin. Highly think of it. Elevate it. Promote it. Pamper it. Feed it. Take care of it. And haven't we all said something along the lines of, I'll quit smoking tomorrow. I'm going to start my diet after Thanksgiving. It, those type of things. Let's just put it off. And that's what Pharaoh does. I don't know, one more night. Just give me, let's do it tomorrow. He's like an MMA fighter that won't tap out. Just like, I'll take some more. And he said, that is Moses, let it be done according to your word that you may know there is no one like the Lord our God in the flogs. The frogs shall depart from you, from your houses, from your servants, and from your people. They shall remain in the river only. Then Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh, and Moses cried out to the Lord concerning the frogs which he had brought against Moses. So the Lord did according to the word of Moses, and the frogs died out of the houses, out of the courtyards, and out of the fields. Again, that's just great. God is being gracious. They gathered them together in heaps, and the land stank. I can only imagine. I was thinking about this as snow is beginning to fall. You know, get snow plows out there. It just pushes all the snow to the side. They had to do the frogs. Can you imagine? Just like the whole, the whole center, you know, lane is just all dead frogs. It's gross. Hopefully they don't have one of the machines that went by and blew it into a dump truck, you know. Oh. Uh, but, verse 15, when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart and did not heed them as the Lord had said. So the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your rod, strike the dust of the land so that it become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. We're going to end with plague three, but plague three, this plague comes unannounced. Two with a warning, one without they did so, verse 17. And Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod and struck the dust of the earth and became lice on man and beast. All the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And the, uh, the god, the Egyptian god that is under attack that's confronted here is the god Geb, uh, the god of the earth. This one, again, is especially towards the Egyptian priests. Egyptians are scrupulous about hygiene, about ritual cleansing. Uh, you know, the shaved heads, they'd shave their heads every couple days and to have, have lice, right? Uh, this that made them unable to worship. Now, verse 18. The magicians so worked with their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not. And so there were lice on man and beast. Then the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart grew hard and he did not heed them just as the Lord had said. This is the last time we see the magicians and they couldn't do it. They couldn't perform this. And he just, again, he just neglected his own advisors. They can't do it. We don't understand it. This is the hand of God. And he says, I don't even care, right? And so... Um, before we close, I'm going to have you turn to John chapter 8, because I knew we we're right up against it here. But there's a few places in Scripture that I think it's good for us to be reminded where we see the finger of God. That's what the magicians say. This is the finger of God. And where else do we read about the finger of God? Well, we'll read about it shortly in Exodus chapter 31. It says that when he had made an end of speaking, with Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. God made the, carved the Ten Commandments with the finger of God. If you'll remember in Daniel chapter 5, as I um, just really rush through these, Belshazzar, he has taken an article from the temple and he's having a party, he's drinking out of this gold and silver vessels and it says the finger of God wrote on the wall, Daniel chapter 5, many, many tekel you farsen, which means Daniel came out and interpreted, you have been weighed and you have been found wanting. And he knees knocking, it says his loins loosed, right? And uh, he couldn't handle it. In Luke 11, Jesus says that uh, 
the miracles that he did were by the finger of God. And then in John 8, as I said, we're going to end with this tonight. Pick up in verse 4. They said to him, you guys know the story. Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. They were having sex. I don't know where the guy is, but they brought the woman. Now Moses, in the law, commanded us that such should be stoned. What do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him throw the first stone, throw the stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are these accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. In the Old Testament, here in Exodus 8 and Exodus 31, along with Daniel 5, the finger of God is pointing in judgment and death. But in Jesus, in the New Testament, his finger writes for us life and forgiveness. And it's by his hand he writes our name in the Lamb's book of life. Amen? Let's, uh, let's stand and let's pray. Father, I thank you so much, Lord, for uh, just your sovereignty. Lord, your, your sovereign wisdom. Lord, I thank you for the grace, the mercy that you have extended to us. It's undeserved, it's unearned, it's unwarranted. And I pray, Lord, that we would continue to come to you with open hands to just receive in grace all that you have for us. Lord, that you'd forgive us from those times that we felt that we had to work for salvation, that we had to work towards uh, the goodness that you want to have for our life and just say, Lord, I, I repent of that. I just want to receive. Lord, I pray for the times that we can have hard hearts, the times that we can say, just give me one more night, just give me one more day, just let me hang on to this thing for a little bit longer. Lord, I just pray that we would be those that let you have your way, show yourself strong, to cast down every false idol, everything that stands against you in our lives, that we would elevate you again as the King of kings and the Lord of lords and let you have every part of our life. You're worthy of it, Lord. You're good, you're gracious. We thank you, we love you. Bless the rest of the week. Bless this people, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You guys are excused. Have a great week.